Well, we come to the second class on sanctification. And you will find uh, that in the, I think, in the hymn, at the back of the hymnal, page 927. If someone turns there, and if they correct me, I'll be happy to be corrected. Is it right? 927. You get it there, and there are two paragraphs, paragraphs two and three, of the uh, chapter on uh, sanctification. So before we start, oh, well, we will start with prayer. I, I love that. Now, before we start, and then everybody goes on and on and on, well, we'll start with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for what we've heard this morning. And we pray that it will have encouraged us to two things, Lord, that uh, we will worship with greater zeal and greater interest than we've ever done before as we live in a sacred place before a sacred God. But also, Lord, that we would be concerned for our own holiness in your presence. And we ask you to help us to understand this through the reading of these two uh, paragraphs. Bless us now, we pray, for we ask this in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. These two paragraphs, uh, let me just read them. This sanctification, now he's referring to the sanctification he talked about in the first paragraph. Let me ask a question before I go on with the reading. How many of you are holy? Okay, fine. Right, hands down. Second question. How many of you are holy? No, that's the wrong answer. You see, the first paragraph talked about definitive sanctification. We are holy. You are correct when you, those of you put your hand up, you are holy. By salvation, by regeneration, we're separated from the world. We've made alive in Christ. We are holy. But the third, second and third paragraphs deal with pro progressive holiness. And those of you who put your hands up then, well, I hope you are getting along there. But you are not holy in the definition of these two paragraphs. So let me continue the reading. This sanctification is th throughout in the whole man. Um, yet imperfect in this life, there abiding still some remnants of corruption in every part, whence ariseth a continual and irreconcilable war, the flesh lusting against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Paragraph 3. In which war, although the remaining corruption for a time may much prevail, Yet through the continual supply and strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part doth overcome, and so the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So now we're dealing with progressive sanctification. There was definitive sanctification. What we saw uh, uh, last week, we are made holy. When we are converted, when we become Christians, we are made holy. The old has passed away, the new has come. The name for a Christian is a new person. You are new people in Christ. And what makes us new? We've been taken by God and we've been made his people. We are new people in Christ. But now, obviously, we are still in this continual war. And, and uh, it's important for us to see in this whole chapter, really, one identity that is neglected, and that is the Holy Spirit. Look in paragraph 1. 
that through the virtue of Christ's death and resurrection, by the word and spirit. Paragraph two, the flesh lusting against the spirit. Paragraph three, through the sanctifying spirit of Christ. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. How many of you know what happened in 1903? None of us were alive there, I don't think. What happened in 1903? Death of Queen Victoria? I'm sorry? Death of Queen Victoria? No, that was 1901. Oh. Shucks. <laughs> 1901. No, what happened in 1903 was that the Westminster Confession was added to by the PCUSA. They added two chapters, one on missions and one on the Holy Spirit, because progressive forces in the church felt that this was an issue that was neglected, that the Holy Spirit was neglected, and that is because the confession didn't talk about him. Well, that's not true. You go through the, uh, the, the confession, and in the first 18, 20 chapters, the work of the Holy Spirit is almost mentioned in every chapter. The work of the Holy Spirit was important to the men who drew up the Confession of Faith in 1648. And we need to be unafraid to deal with it. I think this is one of the issues that was raised um, 50 years ago by uh, the Charismatic Movement. They placed such an emphasis on the Holy Spirit that they missed out on important doctrine. And we still have it today, as you well know. I'm sure that you're all familiar with churches which are charismatic in uh, their, uh, um, in their de de demeanor and in their, and their doctrine. And that you've got to be baptized with the Spirit. Um, I, I remember very well as a very sad time in my own life. I was very down, very depressed, very unhappy. And I went to a conference, a day conference, and uh, I was talking to someone who I knew quite well. Uh, he was a Presbyterian minister in the, in the Presbyterian Church of Wales, had been, he'd come out of that. And, um, and I had come out of that, and, and we had a lot in common, though he was somewhat older than I. And we were talking, and uh, I was telling him about what I was trying to do, and, uh, and nothing was happening. It's uh, the refrain of young ministers, uh, that they do all the things that they've, been, uh, that they've been taught, or have they picked up with other people as I was, and uh, nothing had happened. The church remained as stubbornly uh, unregenerate as it had been. And I was telling him all these things, and he said to me, have you baptized, been baptized with the Spirit? Uh, he is an orthodox fellow. Have you been baptized with the Spirit? Now, how would you answer? I know, what I, 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 I know what I said, but I don't know why I said it. But what would you say if someone came up to you and said, are you baptized with the Spirit? What would you say? If you're not, if I'm not baptized with the Spirit, I'm still dead. That's right. That's what my answer to him was. I was baptized with the Spirit, but I didn't quite understand it all. And if any of you are confronted like that and, and, and you meet somebody and they say, are you baptized with the Spirit? Don't fail to say, I am. If you're a believer, you are baptized with the Spirit. You've been transformed. And so that kind of teaching has influenced our thinking. But the fact is that we, uh, as Reformed Christians, believe ardently in the baptism of the Spirit, in the work of the Spirit. And that is how we came from death to life. How we came from darkness to light. How uh, we have to fight a warfare because of our own sin. We are baptized with the Spirit. And and we should never be ashamed of saying that. Not only are we baptized in the Spirit, but he's working in us. See, that's why I asked you, how many of you are holy? Well, 
I so want to be holy. Is that your plea? I so want to be holy. And that's what's uh, talked about in this passage here. Now then, what we've got to understand is that sanctification is throughout the whole man. There's no part of us that is not influenced by the work of the Holy Spirit in our sanctification. It's the whole man. As someone said, it's the whole Christ to the whole man. All of us, every part of us, is affected by the work of the Spirit. Our mind, our will, our ambition, it's all affected. And yet it's imperfect. None of us become perfect in this life. Um, we're called upon to be holy. To be holy like God. That's definitive sanctification. But we have to progress to holiness. And that's the goal. Let me just turn to some scriptures here. First of all, we are commanded to be holy. Uh, Ezekiel 36, 27. And I don't know if... Uh, uh, let me read it to you. Thus says the Lord God, This also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them, to increase their people like a flock, like the flock of sacrifices, like the flock of Israel during her appointed feasts. Then they will know that I am the Lord. That is the duty of, of the Christian to know God as he is in his power and in his authority. Turn with me again to um, 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 1 if you, if you so wish. 2 Corinthians chapter 7 And verse 1, I must learn to use those little colored tabs and then I would be able to turn more quickly to those passages. Since we have these promises, and he's talking to about chapter 6, uh, the temple of the living God. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. This is what we're called to do. And these are the uh, ways by which we will become as God would have us be. Uh, turn with me, if you are, uh, uh, to 2 Thessalonians. Thess uh, second uh, letter to the Thessalonians. And, and chapter uh, 5. Can't be chapter 5 because there is no chapter 5 in 2 Thessalonians. It must be 1 Thessalonians. Why don't I read properly? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit and soul and body, he's not talking there about a, a three-partite uh, division of our being, it's a two-partite, it's body and soul, but he includes spirit as the, the spirit in which we do our, our work and, uh, and in which we pursue holiness. Sanctify, keep, may keep your whole spirit and soul and body. Keep be blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who called you is faithful. He will surely do it. And so he's emphasizing the fact that the work of sanctification is a work that God does in us by his spirit, the third person in the Trinity, in order to make us holy. Now, why do we need that? Well, look at this uh, paragraph again. Abiding, uh, there abide still some remnants of corruption in every part. Sin is deforming. None of us uh, would like to think we're deformed. 
I think uh, most of us think we are either the most beautiful people or the most handsome people. Uh, <clears throat> but in God's sight, sin has deformed us. He's made us ugly. Sin has made us ugly in the sight of God. And we need to remember that. Uh, it will affect our pride significantly if we see ourselves not as fine, upstanding, um, excellent. In the sight of God, we're perfect, but we're also deformed by sin. And as a consequence of that deformation, we are at war. Uh, people don't like talking about war, but there is war, and we're at war. And, and we've got to understand that. We cannot possibly understand the process of sanctification without realizing we are in an abiding warfare. And, and, and so it is from our experience. I'm quite sure that all of you know how disappointing our lives are if we've got any sense of, of the holiness of God and the magnitude of Christ's sacrifice for us that we are upset, we are disappointed, we are frustrated and we are constantly at war. The, the good that I would, says the Apostle Paul in, in, in Romans 7, the good that I would, I do not. And the evil that I would not, that I do. That's the warfare. <clears throat> and Paul, and Paul in, in Romans 6 and 7 is always talking about this warfare. Uh, the, uh, in Galatians 5, he talks about mortifying sin, but we'll come to that in a moment. It's the, the effect of sin on us I want to emphasize to you so that you would be stirred up to do something about it and to take part in this warfare willingly and, and, and enthusiastically. I, I don't know um, when they were commissioning people for, um, uh, for World War II in, in, in this country. Uh, it was so stated that, that people were just pouring into the recruiting offices. They were just wanting to go off. They, uh, World War I, I'm sorry, not World War II. And, uh, and it was slaughter. World War I was a scene of unparalleled slaughter uh, in terms of warfare. Um, but people were enthusiastic about it. Well, we as believers should be enthusiastic about engaging in this warfare, dealing with our own sin, when, because we're told it's an irreconcilable war. It'll go on until the day you die. And you have to fight with it. And, and, and as you proceed in the faith, um, I, I'm one of the older people here. Only um, uh, Dale uh, is older than me, I think. And, uh, and I'm sure he would say the same thing that you think you've got a conquest over a particular sin in your life. You think you've got it. Bingo. You fall. How many of you can identify with that? Trying to deal with a particular sin in your life and you think you've dealt with it and then you fall. How many of you experienced that? Yeah, I thought so. I'm so glad. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the only one. And it, it, it is really the flesh, what, you know, what I want to do, says the apostle, the good that I would, I do not, and the evil that I would not, that I do. It's the flesh against the spirit. And the spirit, thankfully, the Holy Spirit within us, lusts, uh, uh, wars with the flesh to bring it to submission. And then he goes on in, in uh, paragraph 3. In which war, and he uses that language, and, and I'm glad he does. Uh, they do. I'm glad they use that language. Because we don't want to think about war. And uh, uh, very often the people who are telling us how, how holy they become. I remember uh, a friend of mine who was a Pentecostal minister. I may have mentioned him last week. 
and um, uh, in which he, he said he had somebody in his church that was actually perfect. He said that he had never sinned. Oh, and I heard of somebody recently saying the same thing and uh, or was never sinning now, being a believer. Well, this fellow uh, was telling me that, um, uh, that there were people in his church who did not believe they were at war. They really believed that it was not a warfare that was in his life. It was, it was not a problem. And so how do you deal with this problem? Well, turn with me to um, uh, Galatians. And Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17. Uh, Galatians is a, a great book, and uh, as are all scripture, but in, in Galatians there is this warfare with, with people who uh, have no interest in, 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 in the orthodox Christian faith. In chapter 5 and verse 17, Paul writes and says, um, oh, let's read from verse 16, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. What he's saying is be conscious always of having God's Spirit with you. Because he is. He, he's not defeated. He is. It we uh, overturn his work in us Walk by the Spirit, he says, for the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And then he goes on to talk about the evidences of the works of the flesh. And I'm not going to dwell with that now because we don't have the time. But suffice it to say, we've got to deal with this issue. And, and, and the Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans with regard to mortification. We've got to die and, and killing certain things, certain desires you might have, which are sinful, certain aspects of your life which are sinful. And they, you, you have to choke them off. You have to strangle them. You have to kill them. It really is hard. And that's why it's the help of the Holy Spirit that we need in, over, in order to overcome these things. And it's always a, a frustration when these abiding sins rear their ugly heads. Some of you are very young, compared with me anyway. And, and you, you really need to understand this, that for the next how many years you've got left to live, you're going to have to fight with the flesh. The world will tempt you, the flesh will want to accede to it, and the devil will do his best to undermine you. Um, <clears throat> Uh, in, in the closing hymn we sang uh, this morning, uh, which I, I love, it's, it's a great hymn, and, and it talks about this warfare to get rid of our guilt that Christ wields against the spirit, against uh, the flesh, and against Satan. We pay too little attention, in fact, to the reality of Satan's temptations. But he's at work constantly to undermine us. And so I want to warn you of some things, and, and, and with these, there's uh, just five minutes left, and uh, I, I want to finish uh, on time. I, I want to tell you, don't be afraid when you slip and fail. <clears throat> All of us slip and fail. Every one of us. But listen to this last paragraph. Yet through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying Spirit of Christ, the regenerate part doth, does, I mean it's old English this, does overcome. And so the saints grow in grace, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. We all slip and fall. We always, we often are in danger uh, of, of, of believing that nothing is true for us. How many of you, and I'm going to ask, uh, I'll tell you, that many people, and myself included, 
often doubt that they're Christians. There have been times in my life that I doubted I was a Christian. Now, some say, well, I mean, that proves you weren't a Christian. Well, if you've never doubted, if you can look at your life and you can say, I've always done precisely what God's work, the word uh, says you should do, I, I thank God for you. But you're a better person than me. And there have been times that I doubted I should be in the ministry, I doubted that I should uh, teach, I should doubt. And these doubts are incited by the devil. Don't be afraid of them. It's a part of your progress in sanctification that you will be driven by the devil to, to you think that you've conquered something and he comes in at a different angle. He attacks you from a different front. But there is a danger. And the danger is compromise. You must never compromise with these abiding sins. It's a warfare. And compromise will always lead to defeat. You know, well, maybe it won't be so bad if I do this. I, I, I could do that. I, I, I don't think that would be uh, alien to my sanctification. If you're in danger of compromise, beware. As I said, there's no need to fear that sometimes we slip. Paul has told us, we've read in Galatians 5 and uh, in Romans 7, that we're indwelt by the Spirit of God. We cannot fail. But we can think that we have no need to sanctify. There's no need because we're Christians. Well... Why should you not compromise? The first thing is this, that it may, and that you don't need to struggle. We, we, we're saved. We're, we've been purified by the Spirit of God. Uh, there's no need for us to, to struggle uh, with, with our sin because we're saved. And we can go ahead. Don't think that for the simple reason that that gives the impression you're not saved at all. If you say, well, I don't need to struggle, that's fine. If I, if I sin, if I do things wrong, if I, if I uh, don't take care of business, I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I just don't bother, I just cruise along, it might be evidence that you're not a Christian. A true Christian will struggle with their sin. That's, that's the fact of the matter. If you don't struggle, then you may not be a believer at all. And that's tragic, that you would fool yourself into thinking you're a believer and you're not dealing with your sin. So I'm saying to you, you must war. You must be at war. What's the best way of dealing with the, the sins that beset us? Well, there are four things, I think. We must uh, submit to the word. We must come under the word and pray. <clears throat> do you pray? You've got to ask the question, do you pray? Do you pray on your own? Do you pray as a family? My family is, has grown, <laughs> but has got smaller, inevitably. I have now 18 grandchildren. I'm very pleased that God has blessed us with 18 grandchildren. But our family is quite small. It's just Anna and myself. And we are a family. Young people, when you get married, you become a family. You and your spouse, you're a family. And you're to pray together. And you're to spend time talking about the things of God together. Well, you must come under the ministry of the word and prayer. That's the first way of dealing with abiding sin. Secondly, there must be self-examination. Let a man examine himself, we're told, in, in uh, two, uh, two Corinthians, uh, or is it 1 Corinthians 7, um, uh, that before we come to the Lord's table, let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We must self-examination. Look at yourself in the light of Scripture, in the light of the Sermon on the Mount, <clears throat> in the light of the Ten Commandments. How do you measure up? 
and you must examine yourself and then look at the remedies that are provided in the scripture in all of the scriptures <coughs> Christ speaks to us of the remedies with regard to our sin thirdly we must remember that if we're called by Christ and that we struggle with our sin we must indeed belong to God and grace will bring us to heaven the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ will bring us into glory and we will see that blessed state where Christ reigns and his church is perfected and and his word is 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 uh, obeyed loved and adored this will be our end we we must never lose heart and so saints grow in grace that's what happens to them as they struggle with their sin so they will be coming to glory itself and and finally we must be grateful I'm not going to ask you because you'll answer in the affirmative how many of you grateful that you're a Christian I know I am the more sin I see in myself the more grateful I am that Christ has saved me because otherwise I'd have no hope at all and I am grateful that I belong to Jesus Christ let's pray Heavenly Father we come to you to thank you for your grace in rescuing us from death and the devil and placing us in your kingdom and in your glory we pray that you would come near to us as we struggle with our sin our willfulness our um, our arrogance our pride our disobedience our slipping away so often we ask you that you would deal with us and that you would forgive us and that you would strengthen us and may your Holy Spirit so invade our being that Christ will be altogether the most glorious and most wonderful Savior bless us now we pray for Jesus sake we ask it Amen, Amen.